We have all heard the old saying that there's only two things that we can't escape. Number one, death. Number two, taxes. And when it comes to death, to be honest, I got nothing for you, right? Maybe get some exercise, maybe eat, eat some good food, maybe prolong this life, right? Prolong your longevity. But outside of that, I got nothing for you. But when it comes to taxes, that one is a lot more gray. Where certainly I am 100% in favor of paying the taxes you owe, but what if there's some things we can do to lower how many how much taxes you pay and certainly how much taxes let's say if you pass away that your kids pay there's tons of strategies to make that happen so that's what what we're going to talk about today is four specific strategies now i'm a financial planner i work with veteran employees all day long in my day job and i'm not making these videos for you i actually help individuals individual federal employees execute on some of these strategies here are some of the four most common. Now, certainly every situation is a little different. So the ones that are going to make the most sense will vary. It will certainly vary. And there's going to be some major strategies that I'm not mentioning here because they don't apply to a lot of people, right? But maybe for you, they would. So certainly, um, I hope these four are super helpful for you. If you want more personalized advice, there's a link below to actually set up a meeting with our firm where we actually sit down with federal employees to make sure they're getting the most out of everything they have. So you're welcome to check out that as well. So Let's dive right in. Again, there's four strategies. Number one, number one, let's start with the first. Now, I've talked about this one before, okay? Roth conversions, Roth conversions. Now, I'm not going to go into this super, super in depth, but I'm going to give you a really good overview because I've got other videos that go more in depth on Roth conversions, okay? I'm going to keep this very simple, high level. So if you've never heard about it, you'll have a pretty good grasp on why this is. Now, why the heck would someone want to do a Roth conversion? So first of all, based on what just our current tax environment, right? Most likely taxes are going to go up in the future, right? Where the government, first, there's a couple things at play. Number one, the current tax law is going to be going away. It's going to be going away. It's sunsetting and it's going to be, It. I mean, the, the government could always change this. They could always change the rule. But just in the next few handful of years, it's going to be changing. It's going to be going back up if they do nothing, right? If nothing happens, it is going to be going back up. We know that for sure, right? And we also know there's a big deficit, right? A national deficit, a national debt that needs to be paid over time. So where is that going to come from? Most likely, taxes are going to be a piece of that. Long story short, you talk to most people, they're not going to think the taxes are going down. So Roth conversions are a way to lock in current tax rates, so that you don't have to pay them in the future. That's what Roth conversions are all about. Let's pay it now when it's low and lock that money in tax-free for the rest of your life. So let me give you, a again, a summary of what this is. A Roth conversion is taking any pre-tax money, okay, pre-tax. So this is traditional TSP. This is traditional IRA. This is traditional 401k. Anything that's pre-tax, okay? When you take that money and you move it over, to a Roth IRA, that is what they call a Roth conversion. And once you're retired, this is generally pretty easy to do. Certainly after 59 and a half, this is easier to do. And certainly once you're retired is the, is the easiest time to do it. While you're working, it can get a little complicated. So you may want to look into that if you're interested. But as a general rule, you generally want to start doing this once you are retired. As a general rule, there's exceptions, but as a general rule, okay? So long story short, once the money is here in the Roth IRA, well, if you guys don't know already, once the money's in a Roth account, like a Roth TSP Roth IRA, that money can grow tax-free forever, right? Forever. Now, there's an exception, okay? With the Roth TSP, you have to, you are subject to RMDs. Long story short, what RMDs are is at 72, the government says, hey, look, you've had your money in this account too long. You've had some tax advantages. You have to start taking that money out. And that's a bummer, right? Because then that Roth TSP money can't continue to grow tax-free. But what about a Roth IRA? Is it that still the, the same case? The answer is no. The rules are a little different. Where a Roth IRA is exempt from RMDs, meaning you can keep that money in there forever for the rest of your life and let it grow tax-free forever. And anything you put into the Roth IRA plus whatever it grows to, that entire amount could come out tax-free. So this strategy can be incredibly powerful. However, there's a few things to know, is that 
just because this is a powerful strategy doesn't mean we need to or want to overdo it. And what I mean by that is technically, let's just do a simple example. Let's say you have $100,000 in your TSP, traditional IRA, whatever it is, right? A pre-tax account, okay? You can technically move your entire $100,000 over to, let's say, a Roth IRA. You can get your entire account balance over there technically, okay, to a Roth IRA in one year. You could, right? There's nothing that says you can't. However, you want to be careful that you understand the ramifications. Number one, you have to pay taxes on the entire $100,000 in that same tax year. So your tax income is going to balloon. It's going to be massive. You want to be careful. Now, in some cases, it does make sense to do that much. It just depends. So as a general rule, you want to do these in small chunks over time so that over time, yeah, you do build up a really powerful after-tax account that you can control. Let's say you need some extra money when you're in retirement, but you don't want to increase your tax bracket or anything like that. Hey, if you've got a Roth IRA that you can touch tax-free, boom, you are set up ready to go, okay? So again, I'm not going to dive into this super in-depth, but this is the summary of Roth conversion. This is one of the first strategies that can be super, super helpful. Now, again, exactly when and how much will depend on your income, how much income you have, how much income you're going to have in retirement, those sort of things, but that's food for thought, okay? That is strategy number one. Again, can make a massive difference in giving you back control on when you pull your money out and how much taxes you pay over time. And I forgot to mention, but if you pass a Roth account, a Roth IRA, let's say, to your kids, then they don't owe taxes on that money, right? They get the tax benefit. But let's say you pass your traditional TSP or a traditional IRA. Well, they pay taxes as they take that money out. They have to pay taxes at their tax rate. So you may not want that, right? Maybe you don't care. Maybe you say, hey, look, they're getting free money. They got paid taxes, no problem. But some people say, look, I don't want my kids to have to deal with that. Right, So keep that in mind as well, is that Roth accounts have that advantage of normally heirs don't have to pay any taxes on that money either. Okay, So that's number one. So number two, and this is for those that are charitably inclined, meaning you like or regularly do give to charity, whether it's your church, whether whatever it is, a a charity. Right. So this strategy, there's no official name that's fancy, but it's just called doubling up your charitable contributions. Okay, now let me talk you through this. Now, if you're not charitably inclined, you want to know about this. So if you ever want to give to a charity or a church, whatever, you know the best rules to get the the advantage of this. Okay, so let's do an example. Let's say that every year you give 20 grand to charity, whether that's to your church, whatever, right? You give 20 grand. Okay, well, what tax benefit do you get for that, right? What tax benefit? Well, to be honest, most people get zero, absolutely zero tax benefit for giving 20 grand to charity, right? And most people say, well, 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 don't I get a tax deduction? And the answer is, well, most of the time nowadays, no, you don't. And I'll talk, walk you through this. So for 2022, let me get my, my real numbers up. So I have it for 2022, okay, we have what they call a standard deduction, right? A standard deduction. And that amount for married filing joint, okay, is 25900 So what that means is for couples that give absolutely zero to charity, that do have zero deductions, the deduction, the standard deduction they get is twenty thousand five or 25900 That's what they get, right? Just naturally. That's the default. Now, for someone to have more deductions, or let's say for someone to have get any benefit for giving to charity. They have to have itemized deductions, deductions they can itemize, like giving to charity or mortgage interest, other things, right? That goes above and beyond the standard deduction, right? Above and beyond. So more than 25900 If those deductions are higher, then you, then you can itemize. You can get benefit for it, but you don't get any benefit under, right? If, you get, if someone gave twenty grand to charity but couldn't itemize, they're getting the exact same tax benefit as someone that gave zero. So, so many people I talk to get zero benefit for giving to charity, even though they could get lots and lots of benefit. So, long story short, this is one easy way to do it. Let's say you say, hey, I want to give 20 grand a year to charity. Well, what if we just doubled it up one year, right? Instead of giving 20 grand and then 20 grand the next year, what if we gave 
40 grand one year and zero the next year. Where in the year we give zero, we still get the standard deduction like normal, right? But in the year we, we, we give 40, hey, now we can itemize $40,000 on your taxes, right? $40,000. So in, as a result, this person got $16,000 extra of itemized deductions just on a little timing, right? Just on when they gave. Maybe they could even do it very close to one another, but long just when they gave, they gave a same amount. So just knowing how these things work can really save you tons and tons of taxes for things you're already doing, for things and causes you're already supporting, okay? Again, if you're charitably inclined, there's actually lots of strategies tax-wise to save over time, so keep that in mind, okay? Now, let's jump to number three. So number three is not just for those that are charitably inclined, right? Even though there's lots of strategies for you folks, but this is a different one, different one. Let me, let me clear my whiteboard. So if you haven't noticed already, if you're on the podcast, I'm actually drawing things out as I talk. So if you want to go see my visuals and the things I'm writing down, check out the YouTube channel on this one. It'll be helpful to have the visuals, okay? So strategy number three, strategy number three, and this one is actually used by quite a few retirees, and that is move, right? Move to a different state, Move to a different state, okay? So when we talk about taxes, it can get a little hairy, but let's break it down a little bit. So when we say taxes, what the, what the heck are we talking about? There's lots of different types of taxes. There's, there's federal income tax, meaning, hey, you earn money. Part of that income, that's income, you have to pay to the federal government, right? Now, in every single state, each state has different rules on how they tax people, and Every state needs revenue, right? They need revenue to run the government of the state, right? So they, different states do that in different ways. Some states will tax your income, just like the federal government. They say, hey, look, if you earn money in this state, you got to pay X percent, whatever, whatever, right? Some states don't, right? They say, no, we don't do that. Some just have property taxes. Some just have sales tax. There's different ways that states generate revenue, right, to do their thing. Now, in general... Every state has to generate revenue somehow, right? But depending on the state, there can be pretty large swings into how much overall tax you have to pay by living there, okay? Number one, California, right? That's a, that's a classically high tax state and high cost of living. So if you want to go somewhere where maybe the type of taxes they have there, let's say a Florida who doesn't have income tax. If you want to go to Florida, hey, you don't pay any income tax on the state level, which is really, really nice. Now, honestly, if we're talking about moving, certainly you want to look at the taxes there, but one of the biggest considerations is also the cost of living. How much does it cost to own a house there? How much does it cost to just do all the things that you'd normally do? Is that more or less or about the same of where you're at? That can be a big, big factor. I see people that retire with modest pensions, modest things in, let's say, a high cost of living area, whether it's a DC area, whether it's a California, and they move to a low cost area in retirement, and they're living like kings, right? The same amount of income they had while they were working is worth so much more just depending on where they live, right? And certainly, you could save a lot of taxes, but also just money in general if the cost of living is down, okay, is lower, okay? So that's a big one. Now, if you want to, I've got a whole video on some of the best states to retire to. It was published, I think, a few weeks ago, but I've got lots of different videos on that, so check that out. And just so you know, the state tax rules do change all the time, so just make sure you keep up to date. Where, wherever you're going, make sure you understand the tax rules there, okay? Now, last strategy. Again, this is for those that are more charitably inclined, but it can actually come into play for those that just want to save taxes as well, okay? Now, we got to love the acronyms, right, when it comes to the government, but we got a couple acronyms to talk about. First, QCD. This is the strategy, is a QCD, or other words, Qualified Charitable Distribution, okay? What the heck is this? Well, to understand what a QCD is, we have to understand what an RMD is, right? Another acronym. And I mentioned this in um, early in the video, RMD. RMD stands for Required Minimum Distribution. Again, that starts at 72. Now, that age may go up. There's some new regulation coming that may push that back, which I wouldn't be surprised if it, it gets pushed to maybe like 72 or 73, 74, 75. So we'll see. We'll see. Things haven't settled yet. Um, long story short, the government, okay, the government who has given 
a lot of the tax benefits to retirement accounts like IRAs, um, 401k, TSP, et cetera, they've allowed incredible tax benefits for these accounts. And they say, look, at 72 or whatever age it, it changes to, if it does, you have to start taking money out of these accounts. Let's say you're traditional TSP. You've been able to have all this pre-tax growth and you haven't paid a dime in taxes along the way. At 72, you got to start taking it out. You can't just keep it in there um, for the rest of your life if you want it. You can't. You have to. You can't. You have to start taking some of the money out every year. Okay. Now, for some people, that's no big deal. So now, for some people, RMDs really aren't a huge deal because they're using some of their money anyway. They're going to be taking money from their account anyway, and so it really doesn't change their taxes all that much. For some people, though it could really make a big, big difference. Meaning it's maybe going to force them to take money out that they didn't really need or want. And so their taxable income is going to be higher than they potentially thought or planned for, right? Or maybe someone just has a lot saved. Maybe they saved really, really well. Maybe they want to give some of that to kids or whatever it is. Maybe their taxable income is going to be affected because look, the government says, hey, you got to start taking this money out and take whatever tax consequence comes for that with that withdrawal, right? If it's coming out of your pre-tax TSP, you got to pay taxes on that, right? The entire amount. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Um, now, what is a QCD? A QCD is this in a nutshell. A, it's, again, it's a qualified charitable distribution. What it says is this. Hey, look, if you take your RMD or a piece of your RMD, and instead of taking that to yourself, if you sent that straight to a charity, okay, a charity, then the government says, hey, look, we'll basically ignore that income. We won't, we won't tax it. We won't um, let it affect your Medicare Part B premiums. What, you don't have to itemize your deductions, right, to get that the benefit. There's tons of different tax benefits for using a QCD, okay, basically sending your piece of your RMD to charity. Tons of tax benefits that, first, again, you don't pay taxes on it. You don't have to itemize your deductions to get the benefit. There's lots of benefits. So, again, if you're charitably inclined, or maybe you're having to pull out too much RMD money and you want that money to go somewhere and not just pay a bunch of taxes, right? Consider this. Again, if you're charitable inclined, it becomes almost a no-brainer once you get to the age of RMD. So keep that in mind as well, okay? So these are some of the biggest four that I see used all the time by my clients and by others when it comes to taxes and, and reducing taxes as much as we can for your federal retirement. Again, we sit down with feds all the time at our, here at our firm to look at their personal situation and to start apply some of these things to, to say, hey, for you, we talked about you know, broad principles, but for you, your specific situation, what makes sense? There's a link below. If you're interested in that, you could check that out. But again, thanks for being here. Thanks for investing in yourself and in your retirement. You're going to thank yourself over and over and over again by learning this stuff so you could be better prepared for your retirement. So have a great rest of your day and I'll see you guys in the next video.